Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the fourth in our Ask an Expert series. This time round, we're focusing on the world of the corporate digital giants, and we have a fantastic panel of Latimerians here tonight, all of whom have experience of applying and working for the giant corporate corporations who are dominating the global economy. We're thrilled that they've agreed to share their stories and answer your questions in this evening's session. The Ask an Expert series was developed initially with our young Latimerians in mind, although of course many people are making new career decisions later in life too. So wherever you are on your career journey, we hope you'll use this session to ask the panel any burning questions you may have. Please don't worry about your question being too naive or uninformed. This evening is all about gleaning as much information as you can from those in the know. These sessions are very relaxed and informal, so please don't stand on ceremony. It makes sense that the wide range of opportunities in these gigantic companies is appealing to the creative thinking of the Latimer community. Companies such as Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Spotify, and Netflix have changed our everyday existence. They're pushing the boundaries of digital technology, radically transforming business and our everyday life, of course. And the pandemic has exposed our reliance on these scarily powerful institutions. They have disrupted the way the world works. And I think of Latimerians as disruptors, so it makes a lot of sense that many of you are here tonight to listen to fellow Latimerians who work in these spheres. So this is what you should expect from this evening. First, there'll be a panel discussion from our four expert Latimerians, Sam, Vanessa, Charlie and Kitty. And we'd ask you to keep yourselves on mute for this part, but do jot down any questions you have for the panel in the chat facility, which you'll see to the right of your screen. And in the second part, the panel will answer your questions you've asked, or you could, of course, ask them yourself. But be before we kick off, I want to introduce you to our chair for this evening, Sam Mickelson. Sam is from the class of 2006, and he works for Google, and he'll be telling you more about this. Um, Sam, thank you for keeping us in order this evening. The floor is yours. Thanks very much, Sally. Um, thank you for the introduction. Great to be here. And thanks, everyone, uh, for joining and taking the time out uh, to listen to us talk a little bit about our experiences of working at some of the, uh, the well-known tech companies that Sally listed before. So as she said, I'm Sam. I've worked at Google now for around eight years, uh, and I've got the pleasure of, uh, of, of chairing this meeting. Um, uh, I'm joined um, by uh, Kitty, uh, Charlie, and Vanessa. Um, and if we'd just like to go around the table initially and each introduce yourself um, and talk a little bit about your current role, um, where you work, and also uh, a, a kind of a fond memory of, of when you were at Latimer. Uh, so let's start with Kitty, seeing as you're, you're, you're in the middle of my screen. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Kitty O'Leary. I think I'll start with a fond memory of Latimer because that has really shaped my interests developed at Latimer have really shaped what I'm doing in my career. Um, so my fondest memory of Latimer is definitely doing art history lessons with Mr. Orm and Miss Bell. I just l loved those lessons. Um, I just, they gave me so much um, joy. And that's why I studied art history at, at university. Um, and then after that, um, well, really, it was because I wanted to be able to shape um, shape how organizations were run that I then went into strategy consulting, uh, did uh, tech strategy consulting and, and some, some stuff with Deloitte Ventures. And that brought me to my role at Facebook. Um, and in my role at Facebook, uh, perhaps during the daytime, my daytime role is uh, in enterprise Facebook, workplace by Facebook is really the tip of the spear of Facebook's move from their consumer business into the enterprise space. Uh, and I grow their business by managing their partnerships with companies like Deloitte, um, growing their, their sales with global consulting partners. So bringing product and services together to solve some of our clients' toughest challenges. My, um, my passion projects at Facebook are all about creativity and technology, how Facebook can, as a, as a tech platform, be a patron for the arts, not just with financing, but also by our uh, tech talent, by our tools, by our global reach, 
Um, so I'm working with uh, Instagram, Creative AI, and principally the open arts team to, uh, to make that happen. Super, thanks, Kitty. And uh, Charlie, how about you? Cool. Um, so I left Latimer in 2009. My, um, my happiest memory when I think of Latimer is for sure getting on the bus every Wednesday to play netball in Wood Lane. Oh my God, I would be like buzzing with excitement. I was obsessed with netball and I was with my best friends. Oh, such lovely memories. So if you're still at Latimer, I hope you're enjoying your netball. Um, so I then went to Durham University and then I've had a slightly more um, higgledy-piggledy career so far. So I did, um, out of university, I did five years at Lloyds Bank. Um, quickly realized, well, actually it wasn't quick. It took five years to, for me to realize finance wasn't for me. And then I worked at a children's charity, the NSPCC for two years. Um, and I'm currently in Barcelona doing an MBA, which is a master's in business administration. Um, and often people might do this after a bit of work experience to think about if they wanna change their career. Um, and I did an internship during my master's here in Amazon in um, the retail uh, team. And I'm going back in about a month to work there full time. Super, very jealous of you in Barcelona. Um, Vanessa, how about you? Uh, yeah, so I'm Vanessa, I left in 2011. Um, feels like a very long time ago now. Um, I went to university in Nottingham and graduated in zoology. So completely unrelated to anything I studied at school and anything I now do. Um, I started as an intern at Amazon um, and after about um, a year I found or I got, uh, chatted to someone about operations in Amazon and warehousing. Um, so I joined um, what's called ICQA which is our quality department um, and I now work in um, operations doing that. Um, but I've worked my way up so I'm now a regional manager so I look after nine sites um, and nine teams really um, at different sites across the UK. Um, so hopefully you don't ever order anything from Amazon and it goes wrong but if you do um, it will quite often end up coming to my team to try and fix it. Never happens in my experience, never had anything go wrong. So you're doing a good job. Good. Um, <laughs> um, and I, just to round things off, so I, I work in the uh, ad sales team at Google. So my job is to, uh, is to help some of our partners. I work with telecoms clients, so E, Vodafone, O2, 3, uh, with their advertising on Google platforms. So the, the way I usually describe it is I'm the guy responsible for the annoying ads you see before that video on YouTube that you want to watch. So I apologize in advance, uh, but it pays for great things like maps and search. So, um, so yeah, super. Well, look, thanks for the introduction. Uh, and um, we're looking forward to kind of getting into a bit more detail with all of you. I think, you know, at the very start of this, it's probably worth laying a bit of a foundation of you know, wh why are we all here together? You know, we collectively talked about as kind of Gaffer, Google, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Apple, Fang. You know, wh what are the digital giants uh, in, in your view? And, and what, what drew you to them? Why did you want to why did you want to work for the companies that you work for rather than, you know, companies that you work for previously or any other sector? So let's let's start with you, Kitty. Thanks. Um... Okay, well, I'll take the most basic route of defining how I how I understand digital giants. First, digital, like they they provide digital tools and services to uh, consumers or businesses, and then giants in the sense of their their scale and reach at a global scale. Um, I think another theme which definitely drew me, which correlates across the the, the digital giants, and which drew me to them, is this sort of democratizing access. Um, you know, holding an iPhone in our pocket, you know, this amazing computing power or, um, you know, being able to communicate with businesses via WhatsApp and have a, a different level of a kind of relationship with the, with the companies that you might buy from um, or small businesses being able to, you know, reach people on long tail. So democratizing access, I think, is another important theme of um, digital giants. Um, why I wanted to work there at, at Facebook, I think is was twofold. Um, one, because you know, as I said before, I, I believe in the role that tech platforms can play as a patron, as patrons for the arts, and I wanted to to make that happen. Um, 
which I do think you can do, by the way, if you if you come into a, a tech company and you have a clear view about um, about the value of a, of a certain idea and you can like measurably prove that, then people will create roles for you. People will create new projects. You can drive them. There's so much green space and opportunity. So don't don't be afraid of, you know, getting your foot in the door as such. Okay, if that, that phrase of like, if you join a rocket ship, it doesn't matter what seat you're in, just join the rocket ship. That's what people often say at, at workplace. Um, and uh, and I think the other thing on a, on a kind of um, personal level is just at the amazing like network of people individually, particularly as a, a woman at Facebook, I, I'd never before seen women in the workplace who had really, you know, high powered careers, like female executives who were also seemed comfortable with their life decisions, um, you know, and, and how they were navigating their, their dual role as like a mother and a, um, and, a, and an executive. And I, um, and, and so the, the, the women leadership, uh, community, I think, has been so important for me, um, and I, and and that, yeah, that that's that's sort of one thing that that drew me into the role, and is definitely keeping me in this amazing kind of group of people that I feel fortunate to be part of. And Cheryl Sandler is a great ambassador for that, right? Uh, someone yeah. that that at the top um, and do that, you know, a mother, mother, wife, um, you know, business leader kind of role simultaneously. Yeah. What about what about uh, the Amazon contingent, Vanessa? How about you? What 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 made you want to work for for one of the tech companies or, or Amazon specifically? Yeah. So uh, Amazon loves to shout about um, two big things. One is customer obsession, um, and one is being data driven. Um, the customer obsession piece always kind of really interested me. I think I probably more in, my, in year eight. I got my first Amazon account to order uh, my English books. I'm sure Mr. McCoskill will be very happy with that. Um, and then kind of from there, like Amazon's always a household name, you know about it. Um, and then kind of as I went on through school and then into university, kind of maths, stats, that side of things, uh, along with animals were the things I really enjoyed. Um, decided that animals probably wasn't going to be where I wanted to have my career and started looking at data driven companies. And that's where Amazon kind of really jumped out. Um, my internship was all around learning. Um, so I did get to use some level of animal behavior in terms of how we learn things and um, understand how people learn how to use tools in particular. Um, as a particular as a tech company, the amount of tools that we build ourselves that we then don't tell people how to use is incredible. Um, but that really working on that was um, a lot of fun. And I got to understand a lot more about our business and the back end of things, um, which is where I then kind of got into um, the operational side. And I think similar to Kitty in terms of um, we've got a big push on kind of women in operations and that was something that I don't think I'd ever really thought of or it it wasn't an area that really ever come across my path before um, and I thought oh it would be quite interesting to see what it's like leading a team um, no one would give a 22 year old a particularly big team to lead it'll be like five people it'd be fine um, I walked into my first Christmas time leading a team of 140 people um, through peak which was slightly terrifying when it's suddenly kind of you know their day-to-day -day job is in your hands um to go through that and then kind of working on from there um amazon is very much what you make of it and if you work hard like our motto is work hard make uh, have fun make history um and that very much stands so i've now been part of uh two direct building launches um so new warehouses that we've opened one up in cheshire and one in nottingham um which is just down the road from where i am now um, as well as five indirect ones uh, last year as a regional manager. So I had teams on the ground who were delivering it. But it's just the opportunities that you then get in these companies um, in things that you never thought of. Um, I think from like from what Kitty said about um, the art side of things that Facebook's doing, I never knew that until Kitty tells me about it tonight. Um, and it's really awesome to see. And I think um, the things that I now know about Amazon does in terms of the warehousing side of things and the back end of I know what happens when I click an order now um, when I place an order on Amazon and it, it gets to my door in 24 hours or less. Um, and I know all of the systems that I have to go through to get there. And that's really cool. Amazing. You, um, you, you often think of kind of the tech, tech, tech companies launching products, but you don't think of them physically launching new huge warehouses in, in Cheshire and Nottingham. So that's, uh, yeah. that's pretty cool to be part of. How about, how about you, Charlie? Because I, I think, you know, you've got an interesting angle because you're, you're ex-banking, ex-finance and, I think people often think of tech and finance as two very different worlds. The two shall not meet. So, so what what made you what made you want to jump from 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 one to the other? Yeah, tech finance 
not for profit. I've done it all. Um, no, basically, um, yeah, I, th I think the main reason was I had five years of um, finance and I realized that um, wasn't really like driving me. I w I'm not that driven by like loans and overdrafts personally, but I know a lot of people are, uh, but it wasn't really getting me out of bed in the morning. So then I thought, okay, what am I like really passionate about? And it, it, the things that I liked doing at Lloyd's was the charitable stuff, hence moving to a, a, the children's charity. But one, what I realized when working at one single charity is I was there because I wanted to make an impact, but the impact that you can make working at one charity versus the impact that you can make if you're in a huge tech company that's slowly taking over the world and you can help channel that to good is so much bigger. Um, and I think I just wanted to be not in the position of like in a charity knocking on doors, asking for money all the time, but in a position where I could be on the kind of like power, powerful side, informing good and positive decisions. Um, and I think I'm generally driven by making people's lives better. So that translates, obviously, if you're working in a children's charity, but you could also say um, that these tech giants, and I know that they're controversial, are making people's lives easier every day. Um, and so, I mean, if you think about it in COVID, for example, think of all the like um, elderly or vulnerable people who can use Amazon to deliver goods, which means they haven't had to go to the shops. I know, I know there's two sides to every story, but that kind of thing does, um, does get me out of bed in the morning more than a, um, more than an overdraft does, to be honest. Um, and then just from my internship, um, one, and to be honest, I was skeptical going into my internship at Amazon. I did not know what it was going to be like, and I, it wasn't necessarily my dream job. Uh, I just wanted to see what it was like. But one thing I really thought was interesting was that one, the workforce is really international, which is cool because you get lots of different kinds of opinions and points of view and there's real like diversity, like, lots of different kinds of people in the teams, which is great. But also everyone's like, I don't know, I can't speak to the other tech companies, but in Z Amazon, everyone is like really excited to be at work and working hard and clever and driven. And so it's a really like exciting atmosphere to be in. Yeah. Yeah, I'd second that. <laughs> Yeah, and, and third that, I mean, that definitely tallies with my experience at Google. I think, you know, having friends over uh, from, from law and consulting, finance, and that's not to do down those industries, but, you know, they're always shocked at how diverse the workforce is, both kind of gender, racially, um, you know, in terms of where people are from. Um, and it's exactly as you said, the kind of the kind of energy, the energy in the building is, um, is, is different to what they have in their own offices. So, yeah, that's certainly true for me at Google. I think... One thing I would say, um, maybe hopefully reassuring to some people, is my, my own experience was um, I didn't really want to work for Google. I actually had no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, and I kind of just stumbled into it. Um, I was, you know, like an average consumer. I knew, knew the consumer facing sides of, of the Google business pretty well. I knew, you know, I liked search, I liked YouTube, I liked uh, maps, um, but I didn't really understand the business side. And it was really only just through talking to friends and a couple of friends of friends that I got to find out about some of the things that Charlie and Kitty and Vanessa have just talked about, the kind of cultural sides of working there that made me think, actually, yeah, that that does sound like a place I'd like to work at. And, you know, that was that was eight years ago now. So it's obviously, you know, it's 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 worked for me uh, and it's kept me entertained for that that time. So. Um, so. So, yeah, um, there was a really good question uh, from Sandy in the chat, which, which ties in nicely, I think, to our, our kind of our next topic, which was around kind of culture and, and the roles uh, and responsibilities of, of people in the business where you are. So when you think about your office and you think about uh, your role and the kind of roles available uh, where you are, um, can you give us a sense of, 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 of that and the, the different types of parts of the business? Because these are big companies that do lots of different types of things. So we'll go, we'll go straight back to the Amazon guys. And Vanessa, I know you've touched upon um, your, your, your side of the business, but what else is there? And culturally, culturally, how does it feel at Amazon compared to other people that you know experience the work? Yeah, so uh, so I've had the luxury of working in our corporate offices as well as working in, in operations. Um, and now I'm sat in my day to day office um, working from home most of the time at the moment. Um, and I think 
very much echo what Charlie said in terms of like the diversity that you get in all all of the different areas of the business. Um, I think the, the thing I like most about my current role is that working quality, I have to engage so many different teams um, across from our, the teams that work on um, making sure our website pages are up to date, um, the people who deal with our packaging teams, like procurement and all the rest of it. And like, I think the thing you see with Amazon now is how much it's growing, um, both kind of organizationally in terms of the other companies that we're acquiring. Um, I think we were talking before about the fact that like, you know, Twitch is now owned by Amazon. Uh, we've got Prime Video. There's so many different entities within Amazon and within the organization, there's so many opportunities to move between them. Um, so for example, I went from corporate to um, operations, but I've got friends who've moved from um, warehousing into things like AWS um, or various other things. Um, like we've got AMZL, so our delivery logistics service um, and various other things. And it, it, there's just so much opportunity um, in big companies, particularly like, like you know, the companies that we're working for and the rate that they're growing. Um, and kind of, you know, I think someone's mentioned it before, getting a foot in the door is always um, really useful. Um, I always said I wasn't going to stay in operations. I, I didn't really want to be a people manager. Um, I kind of wanted that opportunity to lead a team. And I, I was planning on going back to retail and working in London and um, living that life. And then actually, I really enjoyed being a people manager. Um, and I've become very much a people person. Um, and that's what I enjoy getting up every day and speaking to my team and seeing what they're doing and driving within themselves. Um, versus when I was in corporate, I was like, most of my team worked from home except for myself. So I then was working with other teams on a day to day basis, um, which is very, uh, very different environment. Um, and like, I think at times it can feel slightly isolating when you're not necessarily working with the people that you're working with. And I think it's something that I think the world has got better at now with things like Chime and Zoom and WhatsApp and all the rest of it and the different um, ways that we've had to work since COVID. Um, but I think that's one of the things that is really impressed me about Amazon in particular is like how we've diversified even further um, since COVID has happened um, with, like, you know, we offer bi-weekly testing for our, our teams who are in site, um, face masks and social distancing stuff and the roles that we've created within that. Um, so we've got entire teams that look after um, COVID safety within our sites and things like that and just constantly pushing. Um, I think one of the questions in the chat was around the differences between the UK and the US. Um, I think the epitome of that is the fact that, you know, uh, I work in, in Nottinghamshire, um, Charlie's working in Barcelona. The thing with Amazon is you can work from pretty much anywhere in the world. Um, you look at our operational side, um, we're now in, I can't remember how many countries it is, but most recently we've opened in Australia. Um, you look at the, the span that AWS has, for example, and it's pretty much almost across the entire world. Um, I'm pretty sure there are some places that we're not allowed to go, but uh, not far off that. Um, and a lot of the roles transfer. So there's the same roles in the UK um, as there are in the US with obviously some differences. Um, but there's also a lot of flexibility as a company. Of if there's a role you particularly want and you work with that team, um, then you can be based in whatever country suits you um, to then connect with that team as well. Brilliant. And how about Facebook, Kitty? So, um, yeah, perhaps I'll add some colour to the, some different some of the different orgs within the Facebook family of apps. Um, so, as I said, my my main job is in the enterprise business. So that's workplace from Facebook, um, making making companies into connected communities. Uh, it's a a product that came out of consumer Facebook, but is now um, shaped and and very much evolved to serve enterprise businesses and help them to communicate and collaborate better, connect all of their employees. Then there's WhatsApp for business. It's also part of that business suite. Um, there's also Facebook's big bet on um, AR, uh, AR and VR. So they think that virtual reality will be central to how we work in 10 years time. And Mark, um, I don't know Mark, but everyone within Facebook refers to Mark Zuckerberg as Mark, as if he's their pal. So I kind of accidentally started to do that too. Mark on our on our weekly Q and A's with him, you know, speaks about the importance of making these these long year long term ten year bets, um, and um, and virtual reality is is definitely one of those bets. Horizon, their virtual reality platform is in beta now. They're intentionally making their hardware, which fits in with their their software. Uh, much cheaper Oculus uh, Oculus Quest is is cheaper than the previous Oculus because they want to more people to be able to use it, um, and then um, 
and then touching uh, Sam on on something you said earlier about you know maps being funded by the ads business. That's also true of Facebook. You know the majority of our revenue comes from uh, our ads business, and that funds these other more long t- more long term um, bets. There's an interesting team within Facebook called the New Product Experimentation Team, and they're all about um, building within the organization what new what is the next Instagram. You know what is um, that they're answering these fascinating questions and they're pod teams within Facebook that are um, innovating and learning and failing. And um, so there's, there's so many different teams that you could apply for. And if you want to just get a sense of it, I would just type in a whole bunch of keywords onto the careers page on any location and just see what comes up and then start reading the job descriptions to familiarize yourself with the whole range of roles that are available. Yeah, I'd, I'd second that. I think that similar at Google, it's a behemoth of a company, right? We've got 150,000 people globally. I couldn't possibly tell you all the businesses that, that we operate in and all the different types of roles. Um, the, the best thing to do is, you know, speak to people like us, speak to people you know within the business, do your research on the jobs boards um, and try kind of, you know, stitch it all together because, you know, the nature of the business is a, a pretty different, right? You can be, you know, my, you know, at Google, you can be on the YouTube side of things, which is a media company and it's quite glamorous. It's probably more like working for, an ITV or a BBC, or you can be on the map side, which I personally quite like and is quite nerdy. Um, and there's everything in between. So um, yeah, I, I kind of second that. I think it's good advice to kind of make sure you don't think of these companies as one company. Actually, there's lots of different subject, subsections to them. And then I think just to speak to Sandy's question, specifically, again, the Google perspective, I think we've got about 50% of our workforce in, in the US and 50% outside. Um, and I think in the past, um, and this is more from an engineering side, if I'm honest. Um, and I'm, I'm not an engineer. No one on the call is an engineer. But I knew that there was an issue with, you know, if a project took off and it gained steam, then it always got transported to the mothership in California. Um, they're trying to kind of stop doing that because they recognize not everyone wants to move abroad and not everyone wants to live in California. And so they're trying to build hubs of excellence around the world. So Singapore, London, Zurich, uh, Germany, you know, all these places are trying to be, to be built up. Um, but I think fundamentally from a kind of, you know, if you, if you really want to, if you really want to escalate to the dizzy heights of the company, then I think, you know, from, from, from a Google perspective, then it's hard to not be drawn in by, by London. But for me, at least the dizzy heights are, are quite a long way away. So I don't have to worry about that for a little while. Um, great. So um, I touched upon it just then when I kind of said, unfortunately, none of us are engineers. Uh, and so we probably don't have the one skill that everyone in this school probably expected us to have. None of us are, uh, are, are kind of computer science graduates. Um, but it would be interesting just to hear from everyone what they think, um, the kind of skills that they have um, that, that kind of got them through the door and got them that job, or the, the skills that, that, that their companies value um, and that got them that, that, that hire. It would be really interesting to hear that. And I think let's start with Charlie, given that you're kind of learning a bunch of really interesting new skills on your MBA. Yeah. So um, skills that I think... Amazon are looking for? It's a, it's a very broad question because there's probably every kind of possible job that you could look for is at Amazon and they're all going to have different requirements. So um, I think for me personally, I'm most likely going to be going into a customer facing role. So I'm going to be in a part of Amazon where we're going to be, um, I'm going to be working with, um, with, with an external client of some sort. So um, the kind of things that would um, make me suitable for that job are kind of interpersonal skills, organization. One thing I would say, if you're ever applying or looking into whether you might be a fit for Amazon, it's quite random, but they have these 14 leadership principles that, so, Basically, it's like a company value kind of, but Amazon have 14 and they are obsessed with them. Like it is quite weird. So one of them that um, uh, that Vanessa mentioned is customer obsession. So, and they will speak, people at Amazon will speak using these, um, these principles all the time. So if you were to have, so what they're looking for in all of their hires is basically that you demonstrate that you, your values are in line with their leadership principles. It's, 
it's quite weird if you're not used to it and if you're not in the space, which I haven't been. So I think I have that external um, perspective. And if anyone wants to speak about this more, I can talk about it for hours. But I would say that's the kind of thing that they were, that they'd be looking for. But one thing I wanted to say more generally is like, um, all of these, all of these tech companies are so huge. They've got so many different kinds of jobs that everyone on this call will have one job at least that they would be suitable to at these tech companies. And I think the key to like happiness in your career is think first about the skills that you have. And like, what do you love? What do you enjoy? What comes naturally to you? And then what kind of jobs might that translate into? Because I think that's probably more likely to end up make you happier in your career and also as a result more successful um, as well. Mm. I see a lot of a lot of nodding going on and a lot of nodding from Kitty and Vanessa as well. Well, could I add one thing to what Sh what Charlie said about the the, the skills um, or the, the purpose values? Um, I completely agree with you, and I think that I got my job at Facebook. Or they they reached out to me on. Um, I call it like junior hunted because I'm a partner manager, but I don't, I don't have a team at Facebook. And uh, and so they junior hunted me on LinkedIn, I think because of my LinkedIn profile. And I had my dad works for LinkedIn and I had very carefully, you know, I decided that at the time that I wanted to, you know, I was ready for a change in my career from Deloitte. And I had looked at Google and Facebook's, you know, values. And then I'd updated my LinkedIn profile, uh, my website, the descriptions of what I was doing to make sure that those kind of keywords weren't quoted, but were reframed in my own language to make sure that my um, my digital identity, like how I show up online, reflected those company values. And I and I made sure that I spoke about that in the interviews. And I think that that really um, that really helped having you know what you say, your presence on Twitter, the photos that you post on LinkedIn. I really think I got the job because at the time I was managing Deloitte's alliance with Google Cloud and I posted a photo of me at Google Cloud standing with the Googler holding an award that we'd won for service partner of the year. And then the recruiter reached out to me and was like, great, we'd love you to join Facebook. Um, so um, nurturing your, your online profile, I think is key. Someone who's currently scouring people's LinkedIn profiles trying to uh, headhunt. I definitely agree with that. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to apologise in advance uh, to Charlie's point about leadership principles. I'm very guilty of randomly talking about them and not even noticing I'm doing it at this point. I'm sure that will be me in like six months. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I think there's something quite kind of um, zealot-like about all these companies, right? There's a, there's a degree of kind of all of them have their own idiosyncrasies that every single you know employee kind of parrots and, and, and reflects. You know, so we, we we call Larry and Sergey our two founders by their first name, as though they come here for beers. They're not. Um, so it's it's something kind of slightly cultish about it, which I I, I definitely recognise. Um, I think as well, Kitty, you mentioned kind of LinkedIn and, and you know, speaking of kind of networking, you made a really good point earlier around around networking and, and how that also helped you beyond your digital kind of presence, the whole the importance of kind of face to face, you know, that, that old fashioned thing from February last year, how, how important that was. And when it comes back, how you think that, you know, that, that could really be an asset for people who want to work at, at these kind of businesses. Yeah, I could definitely share more on that, Sam. Um, the thing I, I wanted to share with this group was really my my learning curve about networking over the past few years. And that is that I, I started off knowing that networking was important because you know, everyone tells you networking is so important. But what I didn't realize was that it's not so much the intent or like the goal of like, I will do great networking. It's instead focusing your time on having a good system that will allow you to network consistently, reliably over a long period of time without putting in like lots of effort. So for example, and it sounds really calculated, but it's actually not. It's just thinking about, you know, who are the people who've helped you in your career and how to how to spend time with them and how to make sure that you thank them properly. These small things that make a big difference, invite them to events that you might be running, et cetera. So think about who your, you know, your top mentors are and then stay in touch with them. Like use a personal CRM, even if it's just an Excel or just um, 
register for for one. I know Google um, did one out of um, the 120 labs uh, that that I that I've used, and um, and it'll remind you to reach out to people, you know, every quarter or every six months. And executives would do this, you know, if you're all executives will say, "Have I spoken to this important stakeholder in my company or another company?" every quarter or every six months, but actually doing it at the very beginning of your career is even more valuable because you have all this time to build relationships with people and you can, you don't have to reach out to people only when you're at a high, like it's okay to be vulnerable with people and say, you know, just wanted to share a quick update with them. It doesn't need to be a long meeting. It could be a 15 minute meeting where you just catch up on life and then you just stay in their headspace. And then if opportunities come up for you to help them, you're in a position to do that and then they're in a position to help you, but you could never ask for a favor if the relationship's gone cold. So I think it's important to always be looking for opportunities to help your network in advance. Yeah, I think it's I think it's good advice. And I think, you know, for, for me personally, I had a pretty outdated view of what networking was. I thought it was kind of weird, sleazy thing that bankers and lawyers did. And you kind of, you know, there was back rubbing and you just nudged your friend and said, oh, I've got, I need a job. Can you get me a job? And your uncle sorted it out. It's not that at all. Like it's, it's actually just getting to know people, I guess, like, like us and helping, you know, getting, you know, getting them to help you understand their company, what it does, how to navigate it, where the good jobs are, where the growth areas are, where the skills that you have might be a best fit. Um, and hopefully you can exchange some value, you know, in return, when you do land that job and Kitty and Charlie and Vanessa and I want to understand a bit about your organization. It's not, you know, it, it, it's something that it, it doesn't have to be this slightly kind of oily thing. Um, it's actually kind of natural and, and definitely something that I've, I still struggle with. I'm, I'm by no means an expert, but it does definitely help um, in your, in your kind of career long term. So it's just about trying to cultivate those relationships and making sure that you're still in touch with people that, you know, can help you, um, um, navigate the world because it's pretty big and complicated as are all the companies that we work for. One um, thing, um, Sam, oh, on. I had one piece of good advice. I think especially if people on the call are um, not sure about what they want to do, so maybe you're, you're having conversations now more like exploratory. Um, one piece of advice that someone gave me was if you're networking and you have a meeting with someone, um, you should always have the aim of getting one more contact from that person. So it means that like your chain of contacts is always continuing. And so um, say you speak to someone at Amazon, say you speak to me at Amazon, for example, and we have a chat and then I say something really interesting, something that you think find interesting in particular, maybe then by the end of that conversation, I should give you a contact in that area. It just means like your your networking kind of does it works itself for itself, and it may also makes your life easier. Yeah, definitely, definitely agree with that. Um, I think we we just touched on Barbara's question. Hopefully, we kind of covered that um, around. You know, do you think the degree uh, that you do at university impacts what careers are available to you? I think hopefully we've kind of touched upon that. Unless you're doing a very technical degree and you want to be a software engineer, and you probably should do computer science. I think hopefully, you know, our background is a testament to the fact that so long as you exhibit one of the Amazon 14 traits or you're a bit entrepreneurial um, or you update your LinkedIn profile, or you've got a good networking skills. Um, I think there's probably a role for, for anyone really at these companies. Um, so we've, we've talked an awful lot, as tech companies do, about the kind of sunny, shiny uplands of, of tech and how positive everything is and how brilliant uh, the world is and how great it is to work. There. What are What are some of the downsides? What are some of the kind of the limitations that you found or some of the things you like not so much uh, about working working at the companies uh, that you work at from a from a career perspective i think i'll take that one to start with um i think working for amazon as i said it's a massive company um i think it's uh this is the sort of thing that you never really wanted to talk about the downsides um and like it it's it's not particularly a downside because it is also has a really good good side as well um, but the rate that we're growing means that there is a requirement to an extent to be fairly dynamic and flexible. Um, so I've been with Amazon for it'll be six years this summer um, and I have changed role, been promoted or changed location um, every 10 to 13 months. I, I've not done more than a year anywhere, um, be it London, Cheshire, uh, Nottingham, 
etc like the, the house I'm in currently is the longest place I've actually settled um, and I've only been here 18 months um, so it's it, it there is a large requirement to be flexible like as we are growing more there is less of a requirement to be flexible and we're kind of putting more roots down in certain areas um, but like it is what you make of it and very much of it it's there's the opportunity if you're you're willing to put in the effort and put in that kind of and be flexible and move um, but it isn't like a prerequisite we do still um, have some level of flexibility to stay where you want to stay um, but it definitely helps um, which isn't for everyone and it's definitely something that I've seen in some of my teams um, particularly as you get older and you don't you know you don't want to move around the country every six months um, or move you know cross countries as well um, every six months as you start to have a family and etc um, that can pose a bit of a challenge um, but it is what you make of it. And as I said, there's definitely the positive of the, you have the option and the opportunity, like the fact that I'm, I'm probably one of the youngest regional managers we have at 28, um, it's incredible. Um, and I wouldn't have kind of got that opportunity without having been flexible and being able to move. Yeah, how about you, Charlie? Um, I've only had 10 weeks there working. <laughs> But I would say one of the one of the things I struggled with to begin with, and like I mentioned it briefly before, was that like obviously there are a few downsides of Amazon as a company, um, and it's sometimes in the news for not great reasons. Um, but I think one of the re one of the ways that I um, kind of saw a different side to that is. You can't you can't change it change those negatives without being in the organization helping to kind of steer them for the good, um, and I think that was something I really saw uh, when I worked. I I had this idea basically that when I got to Amazon, people would be kind of really um, like doggy dog and just want to like make money because we just read these headlines when actually I got there and I realized a lot of people really want to make a positive impact and really do care about the customer and really do care about kind of like the legacy that they're leaving they're leading um so I think it's kind of like a mindset thing about how you can use these things uh, for the good um and another thing I would say is these are huge companies they're so huge um, that sometimes you could feel like a bit lost um, because there's so many, so many, I mean, Amazon employs nearly a million people or something ridiculous. So, um, but I think you could also just spin that in a different way and think, well, it's an amazing chance to meet lots and lots of different kinds of people. Um, so yeah, there's two sides to every story, I guess. Yeah, I agree with that. And how about you, Kitty? I think it's on a similar theme. I think my, if I had to think of one challenge I've had uh, working at Facebook, it's been, um, it's been learning to set clear boundaries in my personal and professional life because it's you have so much autonomy and freedom. I no one's telling me when to do a particular thing. I just know what my goals are and I I need to hit them, and um, and you work you're working through people. What am I saying? Um, I think because there is so much opportunity and because the companies are moving at such a fast pace, you need to know um, how hard to push yourself and when it's too much. So you need to kind of know how to set your own boundaries. Um, perhaps is is one thing. Um, yeah, we had, a, but, um, we, had a, we had a similar thing at Google. We, we had a, a line which I really disliked, which is bring your whole self to work. And I thought, actually, no, I'm fine. I'm going to leave a bit of myself with my friends and my family and my wife. That's actually me. I'll bring my work self to work. I don't want to live here, breathe here, eat here, do everything here. I kind of want to make sure that there is some, some difference. And as you said, they're so big and, and they can become so all-consuming that sometimes you do just have to be very clear about this is the line beyond which you know, I become you know, separate from, from my company and my job. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. We have that trend too at, at, at Facebook. And, and and it's part of this thing of allowing people to be their authentic selves at work, um, which is very positive. But yeah, I do think there's um, there's a line at which people make commercial decisions because they're in a commercial environment and 
you know, you're their friend, but you're their business colleague first and they're going to make the right decisions for the business. Things like that. Like it's, it's good to have, I agree, some, some emotional separation. Yeah, totally agree. And I think, um, I guess from a Google perspective and also just because I think it answers a previous question. Um, I think, I can't speak for the other companies. I think Google is a great place to start your career or to have a career in your kind of anywhere from leaving school to kind of, you know, 30, 35, I'm, I'm 32. Um, and I'm kind of, I'm reaching kind of the middle of my career now and that's becoming a little challenging uh, to kind of break through uh, because there's an awful lot of space at the bottom, but actually once you get to that level, there's people that have been there a long time. They're very capable, competent people. It's 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 a harder place to kind of grow into that middle or more senior senior level. Um, and I think um, just on that point about training, I think again one of the things that I I personally love about Google is that you know because there are so many people, there is someone whose responsibility it is to do everything. So when the pandemic started, we had a team of like ten, you know probably you know psychology PhDs writing a document about how to help staff cope with the ructions of working from home. Um, and that was distributed, you know, to the entire organization. And so you, you, you very quickly know there's some very smart people that have thought very long and hard about what the right thing to do is here. And that, that's true of lots of different things. It's true of being a manager and, and leadership principles. We have our own. Um, so that's, that's great. But the danger, I think, is that if you do join a Google and you stay a bit too long, you can end up in a very niche specialized role and it becomes quite hard to leave because we're so big. So you get people, you know, in, in the London office or the Dublin office who've been at Google eight years and they end up looking after a very small part of a very small product, which is a Google specific thing and uses Google specific tools. And then they find it very hard to kind of move sideways. So it's not a critical problem. I think if you're aware of that, and I, I've been kind of lucky and also partially aware of that, you can navigate in such a way you become a bit of a generalist and, and that gives you flexibility um, but if you you know and if you want to be a specialist then by all means go down that specialist route but there are some people I think that have kind of that have got stuck um, in, in kind of little cul-de-sacs which hasn't been where they wanted their career to go um, so so that'd be the one kind of watch out I'd have uh, from Google um, I know we're kind of we're running a little low on time we've only got seven minutes and there's a number of questions um, so I'm going to go to Jade's question which uh is a really good one and, and one that we knew would kind of come up. Obviously, pandemic has changed um, all our lives a lot. So thank you for asking this, Jade. Um, and it's all around return to office um, and, and, and how the different companies are approaching that. I'm going to I'm also going to expand that slightly and just say, um, how, how, is, how is generally how generally do you feel your companies dealt with the pandemic and what's what's changed and, and what do you think? What do you see uh, as kind of continuing as you kind of go forward? Because um, the question was about Amazon first, I'll go to let's go to Vanessa and, and see what she has to say about returning to office and what they said. Yeah, so I think the, the message is different for every um, areas of business. So, for example, I was on sites um, throughout the pandemic. Um, I've less so since I've been in my most recent promotion, um, but that didn't happen until November. So I spent the first, you know, however many months it was of pandemic being on site. Um, we have a lot of safety protocols that are put in place and I think actually how Amazon has responded to COVID um, in general is one of the things that actually makes me proudest to work for Amazon. Um, so we very quickly built teams um, on how we dealt with it, but not just only in our FCs, but also in our delivery network so that people were still able to get their parcels um, in our corporate offices, et cetera, as well. Um, to the extent of we, I, I mentioned earlier, we do te um, on-site testing. Um, so any Amazonian can get an on-site test that goes to an Amazon lab. Um, we created labs across the across the world um, to be able to test our employees so we weren't stretching um, the EU or UK labs or uh, any more than we had to. Um, we're encouraging people to get vaccinated and giving time off and that sort of things. I think there is definitely a push to get people back into the office um, because ultimately like there's a lot of discussion about how we better collaborate. Um, a lot of conversations come from working together like I think it's water cooler discussions um, is the old school term, but, you know, having a coffee over a cup of coffee, the chat you have about, um, you know, even what you did last night or just talking to someone about, you know, what you had for dinner last night, the conversations that, that then kind of those those conversations and interactions spawn um, is brilliant from a co collaborative and um, creative environment, which you just don't get from working from home um, as much. And it can feel quite isolating, which is definitely why we're kind of looking to get more people back in the office. But we're putting a lot of safety measures in place to make that happen be it, uh, you know, masks, social distancing. Um, we've got 
mechanisms in place from a machine learning perspective to be able to see when people are less than two meters apart. So we've got loudspeakers that tell people when they're not two meters apart because we, we initially had people telling people that they weren't two meters apart. But the problem with that is then you've got an additional person who's standing in that area who doesn't need to be. Um, so we've kind of tried to automate it where we can. Um, we've got, you know, sanitation stations across buildings, like anything and everything that you could think of, Amazon's doing it. Um, and as I said, it, like it's been made me immensely proud to see we had, um, it, uh, what do we call it, commerce come, uh, um, come around our Amazon sites when people first started going back to work to show what we'd already been doing and how we could make that return to work as safe as possible. Um, and that's just continued as we've gone on into the pandemic as well. Yeah, it's been very, very similar to Google. How about, how about you, Kitty, at Facebook? What's the latest messaging there? Um, um, first of all, I'm not sure I could go back into the office if I had a machine shouting at me that I was, wasn't more than two people. I think I'd rather stay at home <laughs> until things are a bit more normalised. Um, uh, I... Um, Facebook has been amazing at, at help, at really supporting its employees. Like, it's truly been outstanding in how much support Facebook employees have been given for their mental health, for caring for families, um, for buying office equipment at home. Um, I, I really have been blown away by the level of kind of care and flexibility that people have had for, um, you know, working during, during COVID. And um, yeah, I'm excited to go back into the offices, but, you know, I can buy my own coconut water, so I'll survive. Yeah, I think um, my, one of my colleagues uh, in a presentation to our team summed it up quite nicely and it had one column with the kind of Google perks, how they'd supported us over uh, lockdown. And it was very similar to Kitty, you know, bought us equipment for our work from home office, pizza nights, wine tasting nights, you know, painting courses, cooking courses, you know, this list of kind of 15 things. And then his wife, uh, who works for another FTSE 100 company, uh, got one day off, and that was it. So, you know, it was, I, I don't think any company has got it perfectly right, but I think that, you know, certainly in my case, I feel like Google has done everything they could, and it's all come from a very good place, and they've done a very, very good job. And while, you know, they are encouraging us to come back, in our case, no one's um, been told they have to come back until September at the moment, it's fairly optional. So. Um, so, so yeah, in that sense, um, I, I've got no complaints. Um, we've only got two minutes left, so yeah. if there are any more final questions, um, I'd please really encourage uh, people to ask. Um, in uh, While we wait for any final ones to come through, I'll just ask, I guess, my final question, um, which is if you, if you had any advice to your younger selves, if you were, you know, a sick former or you just left Latimer, you know, whether at university or doing something else, what would you, what would you give to yourself as you kind of come into the world of work and if you wanted to, uh, work for one of the tech companies what, what would you say to yourself I know Kitty you talked about networking so maybe I'll go to go to Vanessa and, and, and Charlie and see, see what they'd have to say uh, I think for me build confidence and don't be afraid to ask questions uh, Dave Remo comes into the kind of networking and the points that uh, Charlie made about kind of when you're having those conversations with people um like I, I went into university and came to, when I first started at Amazon I didn't have a huge amount of confidence um and like uh, that very quickly gets stamped out of you when you get put on to present to very senior people in your kind of second or third week um, um but it's it should have those confidence and have those conversations and be very open about what you don't know um we always say there's no stupid questions and that is very much the case of put your hand up and say i don't know what i don't know and like look for help and ask those questions no one is ever going to judge you for that and everyone is always generally very helpful and um you know, will teach you and use that as an opportunity to help you develop. Um, whereas I always kind of wanted to take that on myself and try and work it out myself, which isn't necessarily the best approach to do. Yeah. How about you, Charlie? Um, I would say two things. Firstly, um, don't put so much pressure on yourself to find your dream job because it might not happen straight away and that's fine I mean you should always strive to be doing something that you love and that gets you out of bed in the morning but um you don't you don't have to get it right the first time that's fine just think just think about something if you can do something that you enjoy that matches your skills I think that's good enough for a first for a first step and then the other thing I, I think I would just echo um Sam's point about networking um 
there's this it's not it doesn't have to be sleazy or like wrong or like just nepotism it can be um see it as a way to learn something new and to meet new people um and at the end of the day if nothing else comes from a conversation you've met someone new and you've learned something mm. totally agree totally agree can i can i um come in now sam yeah of course um, i'd so. like to say I want to go and work for Amazon and Google and Facebook now. Um, it all sounds very exciting. And thank you so much for give, being so generous with your time and allowing us to network with you tonight. I think it's been a really lively discussion. We had great questions. Um, and I'm sure some of you listening will want to follow up and contact members of the panel, do a bit of, of networking. If you are um, a member of the alumni net, um, community, you can contact the panel via Latima Connects or any of you in the sixth form or anybody who wants to. Uh, if you email the foundation office, um, we can put you in touch with the panel uh, there as well. And while you're all here, can I do um, a little, um, uh, um, uh, a plug for our next Ask an Expert, which is on June the 9th. Um, it's going to be about the charitable sector, which is interesting because Charlie talked about that as well. So any of you are thinking about working in the charitable sector, that's a good one for you. All these Ask an Expert um, events are filmed and they'll be posted on our video library on the Latimer Foundation website. So if you missed half of it, or you want to send it to somebody else or watch it again, please do. Um, all our events come are on our uh, website and that will all come up. You'll be sent emails about that. But can I just say thank you so much to our panel and to all of you, our audience, and good night.